Welcome everyone to this special follow-up video to Protect X5 and I'm delighted to be joined today by Matt Bone from Munich Re. So Matt, welcome. Thank you, Roger. Good to be here. Great to see you. Matt, before we get into talking about the subjects and the topics that were debated at Protect X5, perhaps you could just introduce yourself and give everybody a little bit of a feel for what it is that you do at Munich Re. So my name is Matt Bone and I'm Head of Underwriting and Claims at Munich Re, Munich Re UK Life Branch. So my responsibilities include developing Munich Re's underwriting and claims strategy for the UK and Irish markets. I have a team of uh, experts under me who, uh, under my guidance, deliver an agreed service strategy, including digital solutions to the UK market. And today we're going to talk about the subjects that came up at Protect X5. But maybe before we dive into the detail, what did you think of the event overall? Yeah, I actually really like the format of Protect X. I think it's a, a really good example of how the uh, the industry adapts quite quickly to change and overcomes obstacles. So I, I really like the concise nature of the presentations from a broad range of industry experts. And um, we saw many examples of how we've had to overcome and adapt during the pandemic and how in insurers, reinsurers and service providers um, have all introduced new ways of doing things and new processes. And I, th and I love the way that the industry has adapted uh, very quickly yeah, in such adversity. But the, the subjects themselves, as I say, there was a broad range of industry experts um, with a real common theme around um, technology and the customer and meeting the customer's needs. So I really like the format and I hope it's one that we'll continue to see. I think for me, Matt, the, the, during the pandemic, the thing that really stood out was the fact that we reacted so quickly. Now, reacted is, is, is fine in this circumstance because uh, we just didn't have the time to go through the usual protracted business cases and development uh, cycles that we're used to. Uh, and perhaps that's a good thing because it really focused us on speed as well as quality. Uh, I do wonder, though, that as the pandemic hopefully starts to fade away and we go back to a sort of normal, that maybe we will drift back into that old style of working where things take a long time to happen. Do you think that we can capture and keep that that rapid impetus that we, we developed during the pandemic? Yeah, I, I think we can, Roger, and I think it's essential that we do. So we're beginning to better meet the demands of our clients now of our, and our customers. And our customers do demand different ways of doing things and more uh, sort of instant access and instant gratification, if you like, is, is very much at the forefront of what we're trying to achieve as an industry. So I absolutely hope that some of these new processes and new innovations are here to stay. And I'd be surprised actually if they're not. And looking now at some of the, the topics that came up, um, during Protect X5, I was really um, interested in what Sabrina Molteni from uh, Partner E said, and also um, Vishala Ravapati from Cap Gemini. They were focusing in on the customer, the end customer, as opposed to the financial advisor. And they both talked quite a lot about Generation Z and Generation why? And we know these as millennials and Je Generation Z. And I guess that the, the feeling has always been that this gen these generations are very focused on technology, and that was the subject to Protect X5. Mm -hmm. But perhaps they're also more interested in an experience, and, and they'll perhaps be less interested in financial services as we know it. But both of them actually said that they thought that Millennials and Generation Z were particularly interested in detailed advice. And I almost sat up at that moment and thought, mm -hmm. actually, that's really good news for financial advisors. Did, did that come as much as a surprise to you as it did to me? Yeah, I have to confess, Roger, it did. Um, I was surprised to hear that they, um, this generation, or these generations would still want and need um, financial advice in the same way. And I think it's still the financial advice which remains constant, but it's how it's delivered is yeah. different. And that's what needs to change um, for these generations. And if I think about uh, going outside of work for a second, if I think about 
my 12 year old football fanatic <laughs> who can't sit through a football match. He doesn't have the attention span to sit through two hours of football. And instead he watches highlights uh, on YouTube or TikTok at a time when it's convenient for him without the need to spend hours in doing so. And I kind of liken that sort of approach to how we should be uh, approaching um, financial service and financial service advice to, to these generations. So I guess the key is that they they want the advice, which is good news for financial advisors, but it's likely that they're going to want, to want that advice delivered to them at a time that's convenient to them and perhaps on a platform that is of their choice. So maybe we will see advice being given on platforms like TikTok and Instagram stories. Potentially, yeah. Maybe, maybe not just yet, but that may be taking <laughs> it to a slight extreme for financial services. But I mean, aside from TikTok and YouTube, I can see greater use of chatbots coming into this space. Um, chatbots are typically uh, available 24-7. So I think that's a convenient way of meeting customer demands, but also ensuring the quality of the advice that's given. One of the talks um, that we heard was from Ian McKenna from FT. RC uh, and protection guru perhaps was an implied criticism of the protection market that perhaps we haven't been as proactive and as creative as perhaps wealth managers have we haven't developed platforms that perhaps engage with with clients as much as uh, as that sector of the market what what did you take from from Ian's presentation and, and what are the specific implications that it has for you at Munich yeah, I, I think that's a good observation, Roger, and I'd probably share your thoughts with, um, based on Ian's messaging and his presentation. But, And I think it's probably fair to say, uh, and I'm saying this with some reluctance, that the industry does have a bit of a reputation for reacting slowly to, to um, uh, the demands and, and modern ways of doing things up until more recently. And as I say, during the pandemic, I think the industry did a fantastic job of adapting um, to the to the demands of, of customers at a point in time which was uh, unheard of, really. So I don't think we've ever, to my knowledge, gone through such a a pandemic, and we've had to adapt very quickly. But that was really good to see because we don't have that reputation for moving so quickly. For Munich Re, I mean, one of the things that um, we've been working on is our digital service strategy, and we actually launched a new. Uh, digital service to the market during the pandemic as well. So the early phase of the pandemic, we've been working with two insurers to launch a new uh, digital GP collection service mm -hmm. called Miraply. Now, Miraply, as I say, is a digital GP alternative, and it's now live in the UK market with two insurers. And Miraply is different to what's there already in the market in as much as we only collect the risk relevant data from the GP. So we only collect what's relevant to the underwriter rather than um, collecting sort of wider for medical reports. And I think that's that's one of the things that differentiates us from others in the market. But the second thing, which is probably the cleverer part, is not only does it collect the relevant data from the GP, but it also provides the underwriter with a fully underwritten decision. So we automate the assessment of the data that's collected from the GP. And does this sit at the end of the application process? Um, so it's part, it, it becomes part of the underwriting portion of the process? Yeah, absolutely. So we know uh, as an industry, we've worked really hard over the last 20 years to um, increase and enhance our point of sale underwriting decision rate. So the market generally is around 80, 85% straight through processing. So Mirror Apply is, um, to, is designed to deal with the, the remaining 15 or 20% of cases that aren't dealt with at point of sale in an automated way. Mm -hmm. So this is where disclosures have been made at the application stage. And typically, the insurer would approach the GP for additional information about those disclosures. And Mirror Apply is a convenient and quick way of uh, engaging with the GPs and collecting that data. We seem to have been talking about electrifying the GP process for, for as long as I can remember, um, but it does seem to be a topic that comes up a lot more now than it has done in the past. Uh, do you think there are any trust issues here, Matt, from the end customer? Um, because again, the protection industry has done so much work over the last decade or so at 
building more trust with the end consumer. You know, we we pay 90 99 plus percent of claims and yet perhaps the the public still distrust us still don't think that we pay all of those claims do you think that giving us access to this sort of gp information electronically um will will obviously benefit the customer experience long term but do you think we have their trust at this moment in time yeah i i, I do actually so so at munich re we've done some research on this over the last few years actually and trust definitely came out as a bit of a problem for the industry but I, I'm not convinced it's at this stage of the process. So mm. I, I didn't get from our research um, that it was a lack of trust in how we collect data from the GP or how we collect information from the GP or necessarily what we do with it. I think that's reasonably transparent. I think the real lack of trust that does still exist actually comes from not paying claims. Mm. And it is only that tiny 1% or 2% depending on product lines, where we, we see those declined claims. And it is unfortunate that that 1% or 2% gets so much more attention than the 99 or 98% of paid claims. One thing that I thought stood out um, at ProtectX was Matt Coulson's talk. Now, Matt talked quite a lot about artificial intelligence. And again, I guess there's always this sort of mystique that surrounds artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, people maybe even associate it with science fiction movies and that sort of thing. And, and again, maybe there's an element of, of fear or distrust there. But I thought Matt was pretty good at positioning artificial intelligence more as your sort of assistant at getting mm -hmm. a case through or an assistant at making sure that the customer experience was really swift and engaging. So is what you're doing with the with the Miraply uh, platform and the solutions through GP, digital GP reports, is, is there an element of artificial intelligence in there? There is, yeah. And, and I have to say, I actually really enjoyed Matt's presentation. I thought it was a fantastic presentation, in fact. Um, and he came, he, the topic of his uh, presentation came at it from a slightly different angle to what I was expecting, I think, on the day. But nevertheless, I really enjoyed it. Um, so the use of AI um, is quite broad, or the use of the terminology of AI is quite broad, and it can mean different things to different people. Um, but if I've given it some examples of how Munich Re are using AI in Miraply, um, you'll probably understand where I'm coming from. Okay. Um, so uh, Miraply has a powerful set of analytics that sits behind it. And once data starts building up for an insurer, it allows the insurer to um, carry out a sort of seamless uh, cost benefit analysis behind the scenes. So it helps streamline a process. So what happens here is um, based on previous data sets, so previous applications and reports that have been returned, it starts building up a picture of um, a typical um, applicant. And if you, uh, the underwriter is requesting a report based on a, an applicant's profile, if there's similar profiles that are in the data set previously, in the database previously, it can do a cost benefit analysis in the background and um, give a warning to the underwriter. Now, that warning could be, firstly, uh, in nine times out of 10, the report from the GP adds no value to the outcome of the case. So you may wish to reconsider whether you apply for this report. And that's based on sort of age demographic and, and previous disclosures and occupations, and things like that. Or it may say um, slightly different message to the underwriter in that eight out of 10 times this condition that you're asking for a report on is disclosed, uh, the doctor will add an additional um, set of questions based on a comorbidity that may not have been disclosed, but is often present. So again, it helps get the right information for the underwriter in one attempt rather than having to go back to the GP and ask for further information. And, and likewise, it has a, a positive impact on the GP's time as well by only going with that one-stop approach with the GP. So that, that's just two examples of how we're using this sort of technology within the Miraply platform. I think it's really important, actually, just to, to highlight what you've just said there, because, again, I think that sometimes the trust issues uh, come from the fact that people think that perhaps 
the financial services industry product providers are going to use this data or going to use these AI systems to somehow trick the customer when in fact yeah. all of it is being done to enhance the customer experience or at least to make it a lot quicker and a lot more efficient and perhaps as an industry as more of these systems like Miraply and, and others from other uh, providers are being developed that we actually take time to absolutely explain both to the financial advisor and to the end customer exactly how it's enhancing and speeding up their experience. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Roger. And, and wouldn't it be nice to be able to take um, customers and advisors through the whole journey as to how these the processes have been built? But in reality, that's just not practical. And like you say, some of it does come down to trust. But I think we can do a better job as an industry in being more transparent in how we use data and the processes we employ to to reach the decision for the end customer. And I guess nowhere was it more clear that the customer journey is changing and the fact that we need to focus on engaging the customers with these new platforms was within, within the iPipeline talk by Ralph Tucker. So what, what were your main takeaways from that, given what we've already talked about this afternoon? Yeah, I have to say this is another uh, enjoyable presentation and I, I, I agreed with most of the points Ralph made in his presentation. And for me, it's not always clear whether technology drives product innovation or product innovation drives technology. Mm. Um, so our, our current products in the UK market have, are very static and they don't always meet the needs of the consumer during the life of the policy. Um, dynamic cover, I think, is the phrase that uh, Ralph used is an interesting concept and it's something we see to a small degree in other markets and for example in, in South Africa um, consumers are able to buy units of protection which they can allocate to different types of um, protection um, so for example you buy 100 units and you can have 25 of those units on uh, a portion to life insurance another 25 percent of those units or 25 of those units um, a portion to income replacement and then the remaining units could be critical illness but as um, you progress through life and your needs change without the need for further underwriting you can reapportion those units so you could have more life insurance and less income protection or, or so on which I think is a really neat concept but I'm not sure whether advisors in the UK would adopt that type of concept and even more so, I'm not convinced that insurers have the platforms needed to administer it. But it's possibly something that we can aspire to. I mean, it's an idea that's been around for a long time. We could probably go back to the late 1980s with uh, Pegasus's com comprehensive health plan or combined health plan. I can't remember exactly what it was called. But yeah. the seeds of the idea were definitely there. I guess the difference today, Matt, is that the technology does exist for us to pursue these innovations as long as the advisor and the customer actually want us to go in that direction and and that's it and that's the mistake i think we've made as an industry in the past we we think this is what the consumer wants and we think this is what the advisor wants and we develop things and it turns out they don't so yes yeah, it's, it's key to have that buy-in early i think if we're going to go down this sort of route and i guess that is always the most important part of any product development is making sure that you talk to the end customer first. Matt, it's been great to talk to you today um, in this follow-up video to Protect X5. And I always ask uh, guests who appear on this um, video to just finish off by saying, what's your one wish for the future of the protection market? And, and, and because Protect X5 was, was a tech net technology special, I guess your wish should be a technology uh, wish, but it doesn't have to be, but what would it be? No, it is actually, so yeah, yeah. it's quite well aligned. It's a really good question as well, Roger. I think um, for me, my one wish for the future would be that all of the relevant stakeholders involved in the protection market, so that's the insurers, reinsurers, service providers, continue the momentum that we've seen during the pandemic and find more inventive ways of using technology to ensure we're able to meet the demands of our customers and ensure that our, our consumers, the customers are able to make informed choices about their protection needs. And it's clear we saw from um, at least two of the presentations that 
each generation has different preference for how they want to make those informed decisions. And we found out in a little bit of a surprise, so I think both of us, Roger, that uh, the constant there is the need for advice. Now, that could be via a broker, a specialist advisor, or div- delivered directly to the consumer via technology of some sort or platform that we may not be using today. So in, in most cases, the drive for better use of technology is essential as uh, the answer certainly isn't reverting back to paper and face-to-face um, advice. Matt, that's a great way to finish and I wholeheartedly agree with what you say. So thank you so much for coming on and reacting to Protect X5. Been a great chat this afternoon. And before we close things off just tell everybody who's watching how they can get in touch with you and with munich re yeah thanks roger and it was great to speak to you today um so thanks for the opportunity so yeah if anyone does want to get in touch and have a further conversation about anything you've heard today um it's the easiest way to get hold of me at munich re is my email address mbone at munichre.com Fantastic. Matt, thank you for coming on. And for everybody watching, don't forget to continue the ProtectX debate. Use the hashtag ProtectX2021 on Twitter. And we will be back in March next year with ProtectX6. So until then, we'll see you later.